Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel where we talk about skincare, grooming, and sometimes hair, so if that sounds like your thing, make sure you are subscribed. Also, come and follow me on Instagram where I post a lot of stuff you're not gonna see here on YouTube. So first of all, I'm kinda like sitting like this. Um, I broke my toe and this is just comfortable for me, um, so I'm going into the new year with a broken toe. Doesn't matter, because I don't do anything anyway. <laughs> I don't leave the house. But today, I wanted to bust some of the most probably popular and questioned skincare myths that we have all fallen for, including myself. I believe these up until like last week. Well, a few of them. But I wanted to use this video to shed some light on some of my favorite social media accounts. These are Instagram profiles, YouTube channels, and blogs run by um, cosmetic scientists, scientists in general, cosmetic formulators, and general industry professionals. And these are people that you can really, really learn something from. There's a lot of skincare jargon floating around. I feel like 2019 was was a year of misinformation. <laughs> so I'm gonna be sharing a skincare myth and busting that myth using a social media post by some of my favorite industry professionals. So the first myth is that SLS is toxic, sodium lauryl sulfate. This myth is being busted by one of my favorite podcasts and that is the Eco Well, run by Jen Novakovic. This is also a blog and they have a really, really interesting Instagram profile too. She is a science communicator, environmentalist, and cosmetic chemist. So the myth is that SLS can be irritating for the skin and is toxic and should be avoided in skincare at all costs. We already know when we hear the word toxic, we can kind of question that. SLS is a cleansing surfactant that you find in everything from your everyday cleanser to, I don't know, like window cleaner. <laughs> It's kind of everywhere. And it's built up this reputation of being harsh and very irritating. But the EcoWell always make it very, very clear that it is the dose that makes the poison. They state that yes, SLS can be irritating, but first of all, it's never used at 100%, obviously in our skincare. And it is of course diluted. And studies that point out these potential irritants and toxicity of SLS often don't take into consideration how that is used within our cosmetics, mainly in wash off cleansers. EcoWell go on to state that the irritation of SLS depends on two things. Of course the concentration, but also the time that's left on our skin, both of which aren't very high. So you don't get a high concentration of it in a cleanser. And because of the way we use cleansers, it's only really on our face anything from like 20 to 60 seconds, depending on how lazy you are. <laughs> they do however mention that SLS can be drying for some people. And this is because it does make such a good cleanser. So maybe that's why as some with oily skin, I've never really had an issue with this. As for SLS being toxic, Toxic. People love that word. Yes, it can be, depending on the dose. And to re-quote the eco well, it's the dose that makes the poison. This is actually a phrase that you see a lot of people within the industry say. They give an example that by definition, salt is toxic. But you know, when you're sprinkling a little bit on your food, it's not gonna kill you. If you're eating a bucket full of it, it's gonna kill you. The same with water. At at some level, water can kill you when you drink too much. So these toxicity ratings don't take into consideration the dosage of SLS that we use on a daily basis as well. There's a lot of information, um, a lot of people ask me about um, websites like Skin Charisma and CosDNA, um, and the way they kind of get their information uh, is primarily based on a lot of misinformation. There's an amazing um, post all about over on the EcoWell that I'm gonna link you to. I ask you to read that. It sheds a bit more light on um, these websites that we go on to, you know, you type in your product, then it gives you a list of ingredients and kind of like a rating. It kind of tells you how a lot of that is based on misinformation. So of course, I'm gonna link everything I talk about down below. Please go read that because I know a lot of people kind of depend on those websites to understand ingredients a bit more, but it's not the best source of information. The next myth is that chemical exfoliation can thin the skin. An amazing Instagram profile and blog that I learn a lot from is at kind of Stephen. You learn some real science here as well. Stephen Allen Co. Alan, Elaine, mm, sorry. <laughs> He is a cosmetic formulator and general skincare expert. He made a post about something I always get asked about and that I've never really known the answer to. And that is the idea that um, chemical exfoliators, in particular AHA, thins out our skin. I've always had this feeling that when people exfoliate too much, their skin kind of looks like cling film, like put over their face, like really thin and kind of delicate rather than just nicely exfoliated. But I've never really known if there's anything that backs that up. So Stephen goes on to explain that in an experiment, they compared the effects of glycolic acid on people with dry and scaly skin. They looked at the change in skin roughness, thickness of the stratum corneum, a change in thickness of the dermis, changes in tool skin moisturization, amount of collagen, and glycosaminoglycans. <laughs> 
not a scientist. <laughs> they used 8.0% glycolic acid on three different pHs, 3.25, 3.80, and 4.40. This was on skin samples. The glycolic acid was applied for three weeks. He goes on to state that there was actually a thinning of the upper dead stratum corneum, and that was over all pHs. The dermis, however, actually thickened. So he concludes that acids can, in fact, thin the skin, but in a good way. The living skin is thickened while the dead skin is thinned and just like pff, exfoliated off, which is exactly what we want, which is super interesting and super reassuring. I do love his Instagram profile. It, it's interesting, but it's not patronizing. It helps you understand a lot of the science that you otherwise can't really understand. So yeah, please definitely go and check it out. Again, all linked down below. The next myth is that you don't have to wear sunscreen inside. Cyril Laurent, 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 who is a cell biology researcher and brings his education into his passion for skincare, a really interesting channel and blog, but he lets us know the answer to this and it's not really as straightforward as it sounds. Cyril is another person that puts everything into um easy to understand science for us everyday people. <laughs> and this myth is no exception. He basically breaks this down into three different everyday scenarios and makes it super easy to understand. Example one, you live somewhere with minimal daylight or you have good blinds or shutters or curtains that you keep that daylight out of your house. In those conditions, you don't have to wear sunscreen. Example two, you live in a house with big windows. Like I got a massive window in front of me here. You like to let the sunlight in, you know, you're a summer person. <laughs> in this case, it's probably best to wear sunscreen. Third example is a mix between the two, depending on the season and depends on what you do. So for example, he says here that in summer, he tends to close shutters and curtains. I do that myself, so I don't wear sunscreen inside either. He says, however, in winter, he lets the sunlight in. In that case, he does wear sunscreen. He also goes on to explain that um, when you are inside, he's less diligent about reapplying sunscreen, um, applying it every four hours. That's pretty much what I do. I get asked this question a lot, and I do wear sunscreen pretty much every day, only because it's become a habit. So straight after my moisturizer, getting ready in the morning, I just apply sunscreen. It's just a habit, but yes, I'm less, Oh shit. But I am less diligent about reapplying it if I'm just staying inside all day. So yeah, I thought that was really interesting. It really does depend on if you're in front of a window. <laughs> so let's go back to AHA. And the final myth I want to talk about is busted by lab muffin beauty science. And this is a myth that AHA makes your skin photosensitive. So you should only apply it in the evening. So lab muffin beauty science is Michelle Wong, who I'm pretty sure a lot of you know already. She has an amazing YouTube channel, an amazing blog but also an amazing Instagram that's really good for like bite-sized science information. Her videos are some of my favorites because again, she is able to kind of like um, give us all the sciencey bits of information that we need, makes it easy to understand, isn't patronizing, doesn't talk down. <laughs> Like, sometimes I watch this, like some like professional people, like dermatologists and stuff, and I feel like a right idiot. And I feel like um, they're like telling me off all the time. <laughs> but no, Michelle makes everything very, very easy to understand, but also makes you think critically about facts and research and scientific study proves kind of stuff. Ooh, there's a lot of that going on. She's very, very good at dissecting both sides of the argument and coming to a very reasonable conclusion. But she does these amazing posts on her Instagram where it's like the myth, and then the truth. So I'm actually gonna head over to Instagram and over to Lab Muffin. And this is a myth that I think a lot of people believed that Michelle actually managed to bust for us. That is that you should only use AHAs at night to avoid photosensitivity. The truth, in fact, is that it doesn't matter when you use AHAs, your skin will still be more photosensitive. She goes on to explain in the post that AHA exfoliators cause photosensitivity because of the way it reacts with our skin, not the sunlight. She goes on to say as well that they cause longer term photosensitivity sensitivity that doesn't go away when the product is washed off, which is one thing that a lot of people believed. Like it's a photosensitive layer that you can just peel away, wash away, sorry. And she also goes into further detail on this on one of her myth busting videos, which I'm not going to talk a lot about because I really, really want you to go watch her channel if you haven't already. Her videos are so informative, but Michelle rounds up this myth by saying just use AHAs wherever they best fit into your skincare routines, whether that's morning or night, but just be sure to use sunscreen, which we all wear anyway. This whole myth came from a misinterpreted study. And if you want to understand a bit more about that and how it was misinterpreted, um, again, head over to Michelle's video. I actually commented on this video because I felt like it's a perfect example of a misinterpreted study being spread like wildfire and being latched onto by um, skincare bloggers, influencers, latching onto these as fact because a recent study showed it to be fact and because it's science when it's really not. 
I'm a YouTuber who talks a lot about ingredients that I like that has worked for me, but I get to, I get told off a lot in the comments about how I'm not linking to studies or um, references, but I've stopped doing that and I will never do that. This is because unless you have studied alongside clinical trials, peer-reviewed papers, unless you really understand the words being used in these papers and know how to read these peer-reviewed papers critically, you cannot understand or draw a conclusion from these studies and trials. It takes a lot more than just reading the conclusion of the paper. For example, I would not look at this AHA study that Michelle was referring to. And I would not think to myself after reading the study, hmm, maybe I should look at the molecular structure of glycolic acid to see how it interacts with the sun. I wouldn't do that, Michelle would. And that's what gives her the right to link to her references and not myself. Cause she knows how to look at these not as facts, but to read these critically and draw a conclusion based on her own studies. And that's exactly how they should be read. Not a YouTuber who can use Google. I think it's dangerous for someone like myself, an everyday influencer, who have no real scientific background, to link to studies and say that a recent study has shown and present these things as fact. So unless you can read these critically, don't quote them. That's how I personally feel, and I won't be doing that. That's not to say we all shouldn't be critical consumers, we should all do our own research and just do what we feel comfortable with, but that's why I wanted to share these profiles and these people with you today, because they have shed some light on some of the biggest misinformation spread in the industry, spread by the biggest brands, even some dermatologists and estheticians, these guys have the science behind them to draw accurate conclusions. And I just find this stuff so, so interesting. So as I mentioned, all their links, all their profiles, blog, YouTube channels, Instagrams, whatever's will be linked down below. Please go check them out. Let's let them help us be a bit more critical about everything we hear from experts this year. I hope you learned something. I've learned something. Um, but that is it from me now, guys. I will see you next time.